Well, hello guys, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to the build of the Boomerang Ranger aircraft. We are doing amazing things with this aircraft, meaning that we are actually getting close to being done, sort of. Uh, we still have lots to do in the organizing department, but we are making good headway. Last video, we got the fuselage bolted together, turbine mounted, pipe mounted, lots of good stuff complete. So stay tuned and we will dive into the organizing of this Boomerang Ranger aircraft. All right, guys, we're getting into the fun stuff of this aircraft. What I love doing, figuring out the installation puzzle on this aircraft. As we talked about in the last video, this is where I will spend a ton of time thinking. So often I'll spend uh, probably a couple hours, uh, and that's not uh, over uh, exaggerating, that's realistic. Uh, I'll spend hours just sitting here thinking, figuring, moving, sorting, and, uh, and seeing where things are gonna fit best. Once I kind of come up with a game plan, usually I can just attack it and, uh, and make some pretty good progress. So anyways, that's what we're doing in this episode. I think I'm gonna, what I'm gonna start off with is pulling these wings off and, uh, and getting the uh, wiring harnesses started and completed because we wanna get all that stuff done before we get the tank mounted in and you know, things like that. So anyways, guys, thanks for watching. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button down below if you have not done so already. And uh, let's dive into the Ranger. Okay guys, so we've put the, the airplane on the stand upside down. We have taken the wings off. Just undid the screws for the gear that allowed us to lift the gear up. And now we can work on the wiring harnesses for the wings and also uh, the final mounting of the landing gear. All right, so one of the primary things to think about here is the amount of room that we have with the opening on the wing side and also on the fuselage side. So all of our connectors have to make sure that we can fit them inside those holes. And then wire wise, we've got six wires and nine wires total so I'm going to see if the, the nine wire connector will fit in there. I don't think it will but uh, we'll see. I could also open that up a little bit more lengthwise if needed so I'm just going to experiment a little bit with the ash lock connectors and we'll see what we can come up with. Okay guys, so I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use two sixes for these ash lock connectors and then use a single regular power box connector. So our room's pretty tight here. The hole on the fuselage is a little bit bigger than the one on the wing. If we take these two connectors together, so our access can go inside the fuselage fairly easily and then we've got enough room there for another uh, standard servo connector, which I think is going to be the best solution altogether. Now with the light wires, so we've got the marker light and the leading edge light, we could put the positive and negative together on these guys. Doesn't really save a ton of uh, space because we would still end up with a six pin connector and a seven pin connector here, which doesn't exist. So um, if we do the sky candy light, so the tip light, on a standard servo connector, then we'll have these guys on a six, the control surface is on a six, and the light on a standard servo connector. So I think that's gonna be the best solution. All right, wing connectors are done. I'm just gonna show you what my process is here. So what I've done is I put the aileron and flap on my normal, uh, what I would call the female connector. I think they're called the male connectors, but I call them female because they receive the plug. Um, so, reason I do that is so I can take a servo connector at any time and I can plug it into these um, pins and operate the aileron and flap. And I've put all the other stuff on the other side of the connector, so obviously you can't get the connectors mixed up because we're using two six pin connectors. So on this side you've got the brake, the, well there you go, brake, gear and lights, okay. And then the single connector is for the front tip light. 
So that portion's done. We're gonna do the same thing on this wing and then we'll make up our harnesses for the fuselage side. Okay, so the other side of the harness is all figured out here. So what I've done is I've taken both of the light wires. So one from this harness here and one from the single. And we've put them together on this one connector. So there's uh, the positive and negative wires have two wires going to it. So this basically is our light input on the fuselage side. And then we've got our gear and brake and our two surfaces. But this is our fuselage side wiring harness, which uh, is all done now. So what I've done is I've had, I've put these together at different lengths. So they're gonna be easier to put through the fuselage when you wanna slide it into the fuselage. Cause again, there's more room in the fuselage side than there is in the wing side. So, but uh, we're gonna repeat the same thing on the other wing. All right guys, next couple things I did here were mounting the keepers for the wires coming through the wings. So I mounted my little uh, normal clips that I use there, I use shoe goop. Uh, there's double-sided tape on there. So that's done on both sides. And then also added my light back here. It's just taped off right now. So I'll show you that later on. All right, so this is how we've got things organized here. I've got the light line coming down beside the turbine. And uh, I just used some foil tape there just to keep it out of the way. Not really for heat protection, but some on that side as well too. So the reason I ran the light on this side, the rear uh, surface controls on this side is so when we get down to the clips, I've got the same clip on the other side, we've got a nice firm grip on these wires. So what happens with the wing connectors is when we plug these things in, we can just push all of the wires inside Nothing moves and uh, it's just a nice way to have that work well uh, on the wing connector. So we can plug our wings in, push these guys all in and uh, they stay put and there's enough room in there for everything to kind of float around and be able to squish. So that part's done. Uh, next thing to do is probably start getting uh, anything else run from the rear here. So I'm gonna run the turbine line for the uh, the cable. And then what I'm gonna do is probably start to think about getting the fuel tank installed. Uh, reason for that is we're gonna run all these lines underneath the fuel tank. And then we wanna get the fuel tank kind of in place and get that figured out. And uh, we can uh, take it from there. Okay, so what I've been working on here is the wiring harness for the lights. So we've got the digital switch, which is right here. Now the digital switch has three plugs. So you've got an RX plug, you've got a battery plug, and then you've got a plug going to the lights, which is buried underneath the shrink wrap here that I installed. And I installed a Y splitter and then another Y splitter. So this is gonna feed the light right here and the left wing. And then this side is gonna feed the right wing. So anyway, so that's what I've been working on. The wiring harness for the light system, which is good. Uh, I have also put the ends on our rear section, our horizontal stabs and vertical, uh, just because these were exactly the right length to go to where I'm gonna mount the receiver. So my plan is to put the receiver right in this area here. Now, reason for that is we're using the JR11 BPX Pro, okay? So this is going to be sitting upside down just like that. So reason I'm mounting it that way is all of our plugs can come in to the outputs right there underneath the, uh, the tray. So it's gonna be nice and clean. And then our battery leads are going forward right to the batteries, which are gonna sit right in this area, be removable so we can take them out for charging. So that's why we're going to put the BPX Pro right there. It's gonna be a perfect spot for it. So now that we know that, all of our servo leads are, are really simple to come to this point, cut, put ends on them, and they're gonna be good to go. Now remember, one of the benefits with uh, using the XBus system is any of the XBus servos, doesn't matter where we plug them in, they just plug in anywhere. So again, another nice feature of using a bus system. 
Okay, so with the wiring harness done for the lights, we're gonna run this underneath the trays here, get it plugged in, and then we'll start focusing on our other leads uh, coming from the wings and the gear. All right, so a little update on the wiring here. We've got our BEC installed. We've got our light switch kind of run. All of our servo leads are run to this point and we've just Velcroed them so they're all nice and stable. So we're actually quite clean right now as far as our installation goes. The only thing left from the rear end is our wing gear and brakes. So what I've done here is I have taken these standard connectors that were installed on these landing gears and brakes. We've cut them off previously. I've cut them all down to the same size and we are gonna solder all of these connections right there. And uh, so once these are all soldered, then we'll run them to the right-hand side of the fuselage, which is where the controller is gonna be installed for the landing gear. So we are using the controller that comes with it. So this is the ER150 controller and it's gonna be mounted on the other side of the fuselage right across from the receiver, which is on that side. All right, so we have glued the mounting blocks in for the receiver and also for the landing gear controller there. So what I did was I screwed the blocks in to the units and then put a high saw on the back, put them in place where I wanted them, and then we're just clamped now and waiting for them to cure. So those are done. We kind of have those position, uh, position set, which is awesome. So we're really not gonna do much more until those guys are cured. And uh, what we'll do as well too is, while we've got some high saw mixed, we're also going to glue in the tank fitting, the vent fitting here as well. So all I did there was use a step drill bit. Uh, this tank actually drilled quite well. This is one of the fittings that comes with it and we're just gonna glue that in. Uh, the tank sits quite, uh, quite perfect for this type of setup. So this is definitely the high spot here. Uh, you don't really need to worry about getting that right on top because you'll get all the air out no problem right there. And uh, you need to leave enough room here for the canopy to actually fit over top. It's a pretty tight fit kind of in this area. So just keep that in mind as well. All right, so we're gonna use the stock opening here for the UAT, which kind of just makes sense to me. Um, so the opening is a little bit too narrow. Uh, so we need to take the Dremel and open that space up just a little bit. So we're just going to use the carbide Dremel bit and open that space. All right, so we took a couple millimeters off each side and now our UAT fits in there perfectly. Okay guys, so we've got the, both of the uh, things that we glued in earlier done. We've run the lines from the main wing to where the gear controller is. We've got the front one sitting out here when we're gonna run that as well too. So now that we've got everything basically run in this back section, it's time to focus on the fuel tank, which is gonna go in this area. Now we do still have the turbine uh, fuel line and uh, information lead to run, but that's no problem to run after the fuel tank is in. So taking a look at the fuel tank, we obviously glued in the vent fitting earlier with high saw, which is great. Now the, the, the clunk setup or the, the cap setup for the tank comes already done for you. So there's a rubber O-ring right in there. You can see that's gonna seal against the, uh, the tank cap itself. The one thing I wanna make sure of is that the line here is not too long. Now this is all pre-done already, but in my mind, it looks like it's a little bit too long. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so first thing we need to do is find out how much that cap actually threads on the bung here. Okay, so now that we know where that cap's sitting, what we can do is just lay this tank down, put the cap on, and yeah, you know, it looks like that's going to be just fine. We're about uh, about half an inch shy from the back of the tank, which is good. Uh, what I'm gonna do though, is I'm going to put some, uh, that fitting looks good. There's good barbs on there. Oh, that one's okay as well too. Um, yeah, you just wanna make sure that if you're, if there's any sort of play 
or your pickup line or anything like that isn't sticking really well, uh, you should put some safety line on there or something. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put some safety line on that little barb right there. Um, just to be sure. But uh, the stock pickup looks looks good. Uh, it would be nice to see this with a felt pickup. I know some people aren't fans of that, but uh, regardless, this looks like it's going to work out good. So put a bit of safety wire on there, and then we can get this tank assembled. Okay, and tank is all assembled. I'm gonna put a piece of Tigon tubing on the vent line, a piece on the bung line, and I'm going to uh, fill this up with some air just from my mouth, just basically pressurize it a little bit and uh, make sure that that holds air and uh, we got no leaks. And one thing that I forgot to mention was cleaning out the tanks. So um, I did this earlier, but I pour some alcohol in here. Don't use water. You can also use fuel too, but um, rubbing alcohol is nice because you just dump it into the garbage and uh, just evaporate. So anyways, I clean the tank out with rubbing alcohol and uh, that gets rid of all the fine dust particles in there. So, so that part's done as well. Now, if we go back to the manual, it's been a while since we've looked at this. Uh, we're pretty much near the end of what the manual is gonna cover. So it talks about engine going in, kind of giving you ideas on controller, receiver, but that's pretty much it. It doesn't really get into any of the how to's install, how to install anything or stuff like that. It does show us the, uh, the fuel tank mounting here. So it looks like we put a big piece of Velcro on the bottom, which, it's not supplied in the uh, in the kit. We'll just use some industrial two-sided or sticky Velcro. And then it looks like we've got some Velcro straps there too. Now the way this, uh, the canopy works is when the canopy is installed on the aircraft, it actually like, it's such an accurate fit with the fuel tank that it actually would hold the fuel tank in place. So, um, so keep that in mind. You don't really need to go absolutely bonkers on getting that all uh, all set up. So anyways, then there's some final uh, pictures, you know, mounting the fuel tank to the fuselage, mount the fuel tank to the fuselage, uh, install the canopy, stuff like that. So we're kind of getting near the end of what the manual is gonna show us. So now it's kind of uh, just take it away and, uh, and handle, it along, handle it by yourself. Now I don't remember seeing this decal set here for the dashboard. So um, curious about that. Okay guys, so I will uh, officially call this a tip time for this episode. I'm gonna show you guys how to leak test a tank. So all we do is we take a piece of Tigon tubing, uh, put it over top of the vent fitting. Tigon's nice because it's easy to work with. I've put a piece of forceps uh, or clamps on this piece of tubing. You can also heat this up and squish it with your pliers and that will also work uh, very well uh, too. So that side's clamped off. Then you take the other side, do not use your air compressor. Way too much force, you're gonna blow your tank up. So all you're gonna do in this scenario is blow into it with pretty much all the force you can with your lungs, clamp it off, and we'll talk about it more in a second. So, now what you do is you come back to this in an hour, in eight hours. This is a great way to do it if you have time. If you don't have time, you do the same thing without clamping it off, but you hold this tank under water, and if there is a leak, you'll see the air bubbles coming out and you can deal with it. So um, all we do now is we come back to this in about an hour. If we undo these clamps and air comes out, then we're good. Okay, so I installed the tank. It's just got the Velcro on the bottom holding it right now and I'm just checking this out here. So you can see the cross brace right there, kind of lines up with that little uh, indent area right in that portion of the tank. So you can probably see the little uh, indent there. Anyway, so uh, canopy sits over top of the tank and we can, get that closed if we push on the back just confirm that both sides work so it's not the greatest fit is my my concern so so it's that guy right there that's causing us the issues 
Um, I'm not sure if it's because I put the Velcro on the bottom of the tank. I don't think it's going to push it up that much. Uh, but that is kind of our problem area right now. So we have a couple options. We can take the Velcro off the bottom of the tank. I don't really want to do that because that is a great way to hold that tank in. And we can also cut that cross brace off. If you look at that one right there, there's no cross brace on it. Actually there was, you can see where it was cut off previously, right there. So I think we got some options as far as what we can do. I'm kind of leaning towards cutting that little cross brace off just to make it easy. I don't think sanding it off will be, uh, will be enough. So I'm gonna think about this a bit more, but probably cutting that off. All right, so just been working away on this for a while. Uh, a few of the things that we've got done, all the servos are plugged in and uh, running off of the 11 BPX Pro. Uh, we've got the on off switches mounted here. Now the actual receiver switch is a pin switch or a, a flag switch. So you pull the, uh, the connector out here or the bind plug type thing and uh, that turns everything on. Now that's a soft switch. So if it fails it, uh, well, it's not really a switch anyways. So we've got the light system running off of one of the open channels on the BPX Pro. So what that means is this switch here that I added, this JR, uh, one of their gold switches, I think they're called, this is a bit of a redundant switch. So uh, this could technically be left on all the time because when you power the receiver on, that sends power to the Castle Creations BEC, therefore powering the light system. But uh, I wanted to make sure we had a switch in there just in case. So we do have a secondary switch, um, but it's not. Uh, one of the benefits of, of running the light system this way is you don't have to really worry about turning this off before you turn the receiver off and wrecking your digital switch. So now we've got that stuff done. Uh, what I'm gonna work on next is kind of running the turbine stuff and getting that stuff mounted. So we've got our uh, data relay module here. We've got our fuel pump right there. And I think we're gonna mount those items right kind of in that area. And uh, it's just nice short leads, right? We're gonna have the, uh... oh, I put that on the wrong one. This tank is supposed to come to this one. Uh, and so anyways, fuel pump, it's going to go right around and loop to the fuel pump. And uh, so just nice, nice short leads everywhere. So that's the next step here is getting the turbine stuff mounted. And uh, we're really close to, uh, to being done this thing. All right, guys. So tip time for this episode revolves around these fuel pumps. So in a situation like this, you've got a bit of a mix of uh, high flow type stuff and kind of normal lower flow type, type stuff. So generally what I'm always trying to do is minimizing the distance and restrictions between the UAT and the pump. You always wanna minimize the amount of restriction on the inlet side of the pump. Output side of the pump, uses a four millimeter line. Even the massive engines use a four millimeter line because the pump creates pressure, but it relies on the intake to be free flowing. Now, in this situation, we've got perfect fitting for a six millimeter Festo line on the normal MAP UATs, but the six millimeter line doesn't fit on that nipple, right? So what are we gonna do about that? And I did fail to mention that this episode of Tip Time is brought to you by Trusty Bent Screwdriver. If you are a sponsor and you want to sponsor Tip Time, feel free to reach out to me. Trusty's getting a little overworked and needs some rest. So let's get back to this. Okay, so what we're going to do is we've got this excess line that is coming from the turbine. So we've got our arrows there showing us which way is which. So all we want to do is take that four millimeter line and install it over top of the nipple. And then what we do is we take our sharp X-Acto knife, 
Be careful not to cut yourself. And you just cut that off flush. Careful not to cut your other line too. Cut it off flush with the end of that nipple. There, so now we've got a bushing over top of that four millimeter nipple. So now all we have to do is take the six millimeter tubing, slide it over top, and it can go all the way over top of the nipple. And then we take our safety wire, do a double wrap, always do a double wrap, around the six mil line, like that. And I know there's a tool for this. I don't use it. I just use forceps or clamps and tighten it down. We'll snip it off and then we'll just give this a fold over onto the non-important side being the non-fluid side. And now you've got a very unrestricted pickup line on your fuel pump side. And uh, that is the way I suggest to do this on this type of turbine scenario. Now on the larger Swewin turbine fuel pumps, uh, there's actually a six millimeter input. So I would actually go from eight millimeter line on the bigger ones and reduce it down to six millimeters to go in the, uh, the Festo fitting. And then, but the output is still a four. All right, so we kind of have everything done that we can do tonight. I've got a bunch of high sol and glue and stuff that I'm waiting to, uh, to cure. So uh, I've mounted blocks on the side of the fuselage for the ECU mounting. I was going to mount it on the plate here, but really not a lot of room. And also with all the relief holes in the plate, like the mounting holes and stuff, it actually is kind of difficult to just put stuff in. Even like this valve here, I'd like it to be out a little bit further, but uh, that spot still works uh, fairly well for getting that valve on and off. So anyways, fuel system is pretty much plumbed. We just have this last little section going from the filter to the engine. Uh, mounted one of the receivers on top of the tank here, and uh, that positioning should be good. We've got antennas that are going perpendicular to each other. So we're going to let this glue dry overnight and then we are in the final home stretch of getting everything run. So all we have left is the turbine batteries and the power system. Uh, we've got to plug in our fuel line here and get it installed on the clips that are curing. Then that is really close to being able to, uh, to test this thing out and get it, uh, get it fired up and put some fuel in it and have some fun. Okay, so one thing that I really like to do at this stage just to get a handle on where things are going is do the C of G on the aircraft. So remember those marks in the previous video that I added on the underside of the fuselage with Sharpie. So what I do now is I take those marks and I put them right over the center of the stand. So around here, we like to use these hood stands. So it's sitting right over the uh, center of that hood stand. And then now I've got the batteries installed in the nose, can put the canopy on like that, can put our glass on here and we can kind of just check how she feels with the nose. So it's a little bit tail heavy. And this is just a rough guide, guys. So we need a little bit more weight in the nose. So now we have a good idea of where we are with the C of G. Now, the UAT doesn't have any fuel in it, so that needs to be filled with fuel, and that's gonna put a decent amount of weight right here. So what we might end up doing is we actually might end up putting the turbine battery back here I've seen that in the manual with the turbine battery back there. So that might be a decent spot for it. 
And uh, if we do put it back there, we'll just obviously make it removable. And uh, so, but that'll work out fine. And then we have uh, a little bit more room to play with up front here with our, uh, our other battery selection. So anyways, that's kind of how things are working out. We don't have a lot more equipment to put in here. We just have a bunch of wiring and stuff to organize. So before we can officially run the power lines for the turbine, we need to find out where the turbine battery is going, right? So that's why I'm doing this part at this point. All right, guys, well, that is gonna be it for this episode. I kind of thought we'd be able to get everything wrapped up on this Boomerang Ranger aircraft, and unfortunately, we weren't able to do so. But that means the next video, we are gonna be in detail, we're gonna be wrapping everything up, we're gonna be test running this aircraft, and uh, we are going to be maintaining this aircraft as well too. So really looking forward to that. Uh, really cool build so far. It's almost done. There's just a lot of little detail work left and uh, we're gonna get that all finished in the next episode. So don't forget to give the video a thumbs up guys. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting the channel. And we'll see you in the next video.